Wine TV. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. Welcome to Lean Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. We're here for another special edition of the show. I'm here with Greg Armini. No, Ermini. I just said Ermini. Ermini, yeah. see? I was doing so good. Anyway, Greg Ermini with Cross Barn. Uh, now, Cross Barn is a sister label to Paul Hobbs, and we're here on the Paul Hobbs estate. And uh, I just finished doing a quick little tour of the estate we, um, uh, with Chris and uh, kind of took over to the Paul Hobbs history and um, but we're we're here really for cross barn so we're gonna talk about that but let's since it is Paul Hobbs uh, since, yeah family let's kind of first let's talk about you how you got into all this uh, and what do you do with what you do with cross barn but then we can kind of kind of talk about the Paul Hobbs history and then we can go right into cross barn sounds so, good okay yeah so a little bit about myself uh, Born and raised in Sebastopol, where Paul Hobbs and Cross Barn Wineries are both located. Right. Um, just always was interested somewhat in working with my hands as a kid. Um, I had, my dad had a fresh pasta shop, so I was always in there with him making pastas on the weekends. Um, and always really enjoyed crafting something with my hands. Okay. Uh, so when I found out about the wine uh, program down at Cal Poly and knowing that I wanted to come back into Sonoma County and Grow, grow up and uh, live. Uh, I just dove right in and kind of took me to this place uh, okay. after graduation. So in 2007, I got an internship at Paul Hobbs Winery. In 2008, I went down to Vini Cobos and worked an internship down at Paul Hobbs Winery Vini Cobos. Okay. And then in 2008, when they were finally done constructing the new cross barn facility, I came back there and started on there. So I've been there since 2008 um, and been loving making these wines ever since. Right. They're really fun wines um, to enjoy, uh, very approachable, food friendly, just um, really great wines to, to craft and enjoy at the table. Nice. So, we'll off track, you call it sauce or gravy? Uh, There's no right answer, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> It depends, I guess, what I'm what I'm making that day. I guess uh, I'd, I'd say sauce, sauce or, more. Okay. Sauce more than we call gravy. it sauce too. I, yeah. I never understood this gravy business. And yeah, we're from New Jersey, so I don't know where that gravy stuff came from. Yeah, no uh, sauce. <laughs> sauce. I mean, more I mean, Vinny over there might be able to tell you, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my the equipment manager, Vinny, my dad. <laughs> All right. Um. So um, let's let's kind of just touch upon Paul Hobbs. Um, History, and then um, then we can go into get into the cross bar and stuff. Okay. So um, Paul obviously came out um, to UC Davis and did his master program out there. After that, he got hired on at Mandavi and helped uh, in their research department, and was really able to learn. I think firsthand, like the best part is getting out in the vineyards, seeing where um, the great best grapes are coming from and I right. think that goes back to even his youth uh, being out on his family farm in New York um, helping his dad pick apples you know tasting the apples he has the story of um, seeing the difference in the apples between the ranches and between the um, different property or different areas on the property um, and tasting that and that same kind of correlation goes out into the vineyard so right. um, he really has a fine eye for the the vineyards and sourcing the great best fruit and that's okay. always been something that he's really established and you know allows us in the winery to make great wine because the great wine comes from the great grapes and the hard diligent work that goes into making those wines that we kind of have in the winery as well right um but uh he started his winery and he slowly built it you know he's a self-made man and 
you know, it's really an um, inspiration to see what he's done and how he's built this brand and now has, you know, this uh, sister label in Cross Barn and obviously his other ventures around the world. Right. So, yeah, let's talk about that a little bit because um, there may be some people that don't know about all that. So, where does he, what is his other stuff around the world? What is, what is he doing there? Um, he's had the venture down in Argentina for quite a while. I'm not sure exactly the date. Um, and then he also has a few other projects right now that he's working on, one in France and one in Ar Armenia. Okay. And um, we also have a project starting in upstate New York, um, going back to his. Going back home, right? Going back home to, for him, uh, hopefully doing a project up there. Uh, I'm not sure when that, those vineyards will be planted and those grapes will be coming on, but very excited to kind of see this. It's very dynamic. Um, dynamic company to be working for, especially, you know, it's, it's very tight, very fam family friendly, but it's also very worldwide and kind of, um, and uh, interesting in those right. aspects as well. Very nice. So he's, he's always traveling. Yeah, he's <laughs> traveling, but yeah. he's always very in tune with what's going on at cool. home too, you know, and it's kind of nice, you know, seeing that and, you know, he sent me an email saying, oh, I'm in, you know, Armenia right now and stuff, I know he's <laughs> trying to make a joke because Kind of got my name maybe mixed up, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know, things along those lines. So, um, well, at least it's called your money, right? Yeah, I think it did think it was that for a while. <laughs> nice. Um, so, how did Crossbarn come about? I mean, where, I mean, where, where did it start, and and all that? Just we'll go through that. Yeah, it did start off as a um, a second label. Um, but in 2007, we definitely made a transition into sourcing vineyards for this because we saw a great potential. Um, the wines that we were making already were, were very um, well received. And so we saw this opportunity to you know, start crafting these wines. Um, and so 2007, we slowly started building, um, getting sources for more of these vineyards, um, for more of these varietals, and then in 2008, we built the facility and really started taking it to the next level. So right. now we have our own vineyards, sources for all three varietals, um, and they kind of do differ from what we might be looking for in the Paul Hobbs vineyards. Um, right. You know, the styles that we're going for, you definitely taste them and you see a little bit of difference just in the in the flavors um, versus the Paul Hobbs wines. Right. Um, these are um, very approachable, um, food-friendly wines, uh, you know, both of our Chardonnay and Pinot are under screw cap, um, so they're, you know, just take them and go and right, yeah. them on the, drink them as you go, you know, wherever you end up. Screw caps are great. I mean, I personally think they're a great enclosure. They, they pretty much prevent anything happening to the wine once it's, once it's uh, capped. I have heard that there's an infinitesimal chance that something could happen if the, the seal wasn't perfect, but yeah. I've never experienced that. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> but, I think I think they're you know a great great enclosure. Yeah, no, so I do too. I, I don't poo poo on them. Let's put it that way. It captures <laughs> the freshness, and both the Chardonnay and Pinot are just very fresh on the palate. Um, really captures the juiciness of the fruit mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So um, you know, I think the closure does play play a role in that. Right. Exactly. Um, and then so the Chard and the um, Pinot Noir, they're, they're, they come from Sonoma fruit, but then. Even though the wineries in Sonoma, you have a cab coming from Napa. So, yeah. why? <laughs> um, you know, it's a great privilege to be able to do the Chard and Pinot Noir from Sonoma mm -hmm. and do a Napa Valley cab. You know, usually you have to choose one or the other. You know, oh, yeah. if you're in school, you're like, oh, should I go over to, date, over to Napa and work in that dark side or come out to <laughs> Sonoma County and, and uh, enjoy the beauty of Sonoma County? And obviously, growing up in Sebastopol might play a little bit in that. Yeah, uh, might, right. Right. But, um, you know, I love making that the cab, though, also. So right. it's a great opportunity to be um, making all three wines at a very high, level, right. high caliber. Uh, just really enjoy um, the challenges. It's a longer harvest. Um, we're still fermenting the last Cabernets, while a lot of our neighbors here in the area are, are you know, closing up for the winter and just kind of... Right easy going and so um, it does make for a little bit more work but the reward is that much more sweeter because you know that you're making the three wines and then now the cab is always nice to have in your right. cellar later in the later in the winter you know 
so you can enjoy the, the warmth of the fire on those cooler days that we have out here. Right. And actually doing that it's a little, was a little bit of a kind of renegade in, in snow, uh, taking fruit from over there. At least, at least at first now. I'm sure the yeah. snow is doing it now. I'm sure there are. Um, I don't think Paul ever thought about that. And you okay. know, I, I kind of talked to him. I said, why did you choose Sebastopol? And he's like, you know, I just felt more at home in Sebastopol. And I, yeah. I could see that how he would feel more at home here versus Napa coming from upstate New York. You yeah. know, I've never been to upstate New York, but just hearing stories from his family and talking to him a little bit, um, it definitely seems a little bit more community friendly like it is out here right. in Napa. Well, I can tell you, I mean, for, for the past week, we've been in Napa for four days, and today was the first day of actually, and this is my first trip ever to this part of the country, okay. um, first time in Sonoma, and there's a definite difference when you look just the geography-wise, whereas Napa was mountains, mountains and then psh, the valley. And you didn't see a whole, I mean, they exist, but you didn't see a whole lot of hills or on the mountain sides, vineyards. Um, at least not from Highway 29 necessarily or, or Silverado, but you, you could, they, I know they existed. Mm -hmm. Here, there's lots of rolling hills. Yeah. Um, yes, there's, there's some mountain, there's mountains around, but you know, there's definitely lots of rolling hills and you see, and you even see them up on the, on the mountains or the tall hills. Um, so there, there definitely it looks like you know just a, a difference in, in how um, wines or, or grapes are grown in the area. I think you know yeah. it's just you don't have like a straight valley basically. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, there's a lot of different microclimates within Sonoma County. So right. you know obviously we have all the different areas just within Sonoma Coast Appalachian alone and around the Sebastopol area, um, the West County as we call it, um, the locals do at least. Um, you know, there's a lot of different, you go out to Forestville, the Grayton, Sebastopol, over towards Occidental, you're going to have completely different wines right. um, from all three sites. And it's all in very close quarters within maybe 10 to 15 miles of one another. Um, so it really brings out, you know, with our Pinot and Chardonnay, it really brings out a lot of complexity because we're sourcing throughout that whole little area. Mm -hmm. And it really brings out a lot of interesting flavors because you get different fruits, different spices throughout each of the vineyards and that's right. kind of the, the beauty of the, the Sonoma County or West County um, topography that we're in. Cool. Um, so let's let's get into the wines. Um, so we've got the cross barn here. Um, so this is the 2013 Chardonnay uh, Sonoma Coast. So kind of tell me about this particular wine. Yeah. So um, with this wine, as I was just talking about, it's coming from about 10 different vineyards within the Sonoma County or Sonoma Coast Appalachian. Um, so we see that complexity right away. It is 95% stainless steel fermented. Um, so it does capture a lot of that fresh flavors, but you get a little bit of lime, you get the tropical fruit, you also get a little bit of the stone fruit, the apples, the apricots, the pears. Um, so you get a lot of that different. Um, those different fruits, but you also get that fresh minerality, um, beautiful aromatics, and you right. get a rich creaminess from it. Um, although it is 95% stainless steel um, fermented, it does go through malolactic fermentation, so it does have that creamier, richer texture that maybe most other um, stainless steel shards might have because they might have inhibited the malolactic, but we really encourage it, we like it, we really have set the style of that, you know, kind of plusher mouthfeel with it. Right. And now is that mallow in the in the tank or is it in the barrel? Well it wouldn't be in the barrel, but it's all in stainless yeah. steel. It's in stainless steel. We, we it stays well, yeah. in, it stays <laughs> it stays in steel. Even some interns were asking me, so when you guys <laughs> When you guys put it into barrel, and I was like, no, we leave it in. At least I in. corrected myself, like yeah. milliseconds later. Um, yeah, so we leave it in barrel or leave it in tank, and um, we bottle it early in, yeah. in later in March, and um, it's kind of just kept in the steel the whole time. But right. we do get, we do stir the lees, we do try and incorporate the richness because I feel like those flavors are so. Um, so important to this wine, it really differentiates it from any other stainless steel fermented right. wine out there. Um, Got it. Yeah. Because of those those little tweaks that we made to it. And are you doing um, in our in our walk with on the Paul Hobbs stuff? Are you also doing native yeast with with these? 
I should have waited for you to not have wine in your mouth. <laughs> I just gotta taste it more often. It's so good. Um, uh, with the Chardonnay, uh, we do use commercial yeast. Okay. Um, the Pinot, we do do all native. Okay. Close to native ferment. Right. And Cabernet, we do inoculate, but we have started to try a little bit with some native. Native, okay. So all we right. do try and do as much native. With the Chardonnay being such a quick program, we can't really be patient with it. Where uh, Paul Hobbs has a little bit more um, time, so you know having that long, long fermentation is okay. very important to their sh style of Chardonnay that they have at Paul Hobbs. Where this one's kind of like a little bit um, fresher, cleaner, ready to bottle, right. pretty quick. And so, um, yeah, it's you know a fun wine to make. A lot of people like it. Um, it's, it's interesting seeing the difference between the, the Paul Hobbs Chardonnays and when we're pouring them for other people when we have a Paul Hobbs Chardonnay versus this cross mm -hmm. this is, It's the biggest difference between the two, two wines, okay. between the Chardonnay from Paul Hobbs and the um, Chardonnay from cross -barn because of the stainless first to barrel fermentation, right. where the Pinot and Cab are a little bit similar in their styles um, in terms of their aging process and fermentation. And uh, I believe that's what we were drinking was the uh, Paul Hobbs Chardonnay while we were walking around. Is that correct? Fresh yes. Chard. Okay. Um, just want to make sure before I go, like, yeah, I was having that because I mean, I do taste a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, not, this is, like you said, it's a, it's a clean, fresh, it's, it's, it's um, vibrant. Yeah, I would say, you know, tension, um, minerality, uh, the winemaker, Paul Hobbs and I always, you know, we both are from Sonoma County, so we have a lot of days in the Russian River, which is the river that kind of runs through here, so we kind of have that, like, gravelly, like, uh, rainwatery minerality, um, mm -hmm. and it's really just refreshing. Um, under the screw cap, as I was saying, just capturing that freshness even more so. Right. Um, but having that weight and viscosity that I think takes it to the next lever, level, mm -hmm. and I think that kind of gives it that salivating taste that you oh, always have. Oh, yeah, you know, my mouth is kind of, watering. <laughs> exactly, it's like, just no, you constantly got some, goes. You got some great acid, uh, great flavors there. Um, I definitely, you know, even though it said it goes to it goes to mallow, I still get some apples in there, you know, so like more golden apple, but I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great flavor and a balance of fruit and acid and minerality. Um, yeah, and that balance is, you know, the food friendly, you know, people out there that are looking for this on the, you know, for, you know, restaurant on the wine list or something along those lines, it's really captivating because it is so food friendly. It's, you know, it can go from, you know, pastas to, to even some lighter meat dishes, oh, to, absolutely. you know, some oysters and some fish dishes. So it's it's very very um, diverse in that manner, which is which is fun to have in your repertoire. Yeah, I mean this this is a wine that you know it's a beautiful day. It's been it's been gorgeous all week in the area. Mm -hmm. um, but if we were sitting outside, I would have no problem drinking this on its own. But with food, I think it would just it would just enhance it quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and you know, all week I've had many wines that you know, some of them I felt were you really need food, and other wines are like this, or you can drink it by itself or, or have it with food. Yeah. But this is definitely a wine that, um, if I had some food, I think it would it would even be more outstanding. Yeah, and it's already a great wine, I think. So yeah, um, I'm very I'm enjoying it quite a bit. Yeah, and of course, you know, these being a friendlier price point on the dollar than the Paul Hobbs. They're great um, values. <laughs> yeah. and well, this Hobbs, is a great value you know, so far. Millennial, you know, the right. millennials, the younger generation, my generation, my friends and fam, my friends mostly are like, all oh, these wines are, you know, great, you know, anytime I bring them around, and they don't have to even be in the wine industry, they just kind of taste them, right. they're easy to drink, and they just can have them with food or on the wine list. Right. It's kind of neat seeing it, it expand over how it has over the last, uh, yeah, these, seven years. So, like, these are more, uh, these wines you definitely are targeting the body glass programs and restaurants out there, because they're, they're good. They're yes. good value. Their their price point's good for for buy the glass. I mean, yeah, and we, um, it's not something that you're gonna just have to have by the bottle. So I mean, I've I've seen it on I've seen it on lists, and, and the price points are extremely good. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's it's a good value for 
for the for the um, yeah. for a restaurant. Yeah, and as I said, in wine shops and stuff, we're really starting to see one of my friends in New York. Um, he's like, I just keep on seeing Crosspoint at all the different you know mm -hmm. uh, wine shops, and I'm like, yeah, we're we're doing pretty well. We're making some good wines and getting them out there, and he's just you know, it's pretty. Uh, impressive when I start hearing feedback from my friends throughout the country or right. my family that I've been seeing the cross farm wines in their local markets. You right. Know? So it's, it's very nice, very fun. Um, let's move on to the Pinot Noir. All right. So, so talk to me about this Pinot Noir once again. Um, we sourcing it from you know all the different microclimates of the Sonoma Coast Appalachian and. The juicy fruit on this Pinot Noir is what really stands out. Um, it just really is, once again, that salivating flavors, but the juicy red fruits um, really makes it interesting. It does have that spice that you can um, attribute to Pinot Noirs that you just really, really, um, really, really get intrigued by. Um, you keep on going back to your glass, you kind of take another smell and it's just always evolving in your glass. And that's the beauty, I think, of this Pinot Noir is the, um, the changes, the subtle changes that it has in your glass and then just that fresh fruit on your palate. Um, and with this uh, native fermentation, uh, very gentle fermentation process with the punch downs that we have and you know it's aged in oak for 10 months and bottled after that so we were very gentle throughout the um, process really letting the fruit speak for itself uh, only 10 percent new oak on this okay so once again letting the fruit speak for itself we're getting great fruit sources that's what paul and his company's kind of built upon you know sourcing out the best quality of fruit and so we with this we just kind of let it speak for itself instead of you know, throwing in too much new oak to kind of take away from those right. great fruit, fruit, fruit attributes. Well, it's definitely a, you know, a fruit, uh, a fruit forward, I don't call it fruit forward, but definitely a good amount of fruit with, with this Pinot Noir. Um, again, fresh, um, young, um, on the aroma, you know, there's, um, some minerality on, on, on the nose. Yeah, there's, you know, there's like some spices type of thing, you know. Yeah, there's good spice, um, different spices, you know, you kind of got the um, baking spices or, or winter spices. Yeah. And you also have some of the um, kind of herbal components, some of the teas that you would think. Like, um, I sometimes get like a viscous tea or kind of a, a, a white tea with it. Um, there's almost kind of almost a white pepper also element sometimes. So those those cooler climate aspects that you get from the Sonoma Coast um, kind of do stand out in this with the fruit that right. might be coming from different sources. And the nice thing about what I get to do is, you know, I'm tasting through all the barrels and you see the differences. So you're going, okay, this has that juicy red raspberry fruit. Right. And you yeah. have this one that has that spicy um, white pepper attribute and then once we put the blend together and we see what it's like in tank it's just like oh this right. is this is phenomenal you know and this is the beauty of kind of creating those blends and the Appalachian wines for uh, for cross corn. So how long does it take you to figure out your blends for, for these wines? Um doesn't take too long. Actually. Okay. You know now <laughs> that we've kind of we've started dialing it in you know uh, being with working with the vineyards for so many years now um, really helps mm -hmm. uh, knowing what the quality of fruit will come in year after year. So when we go to put the blends together, we kind of know what to expect, and we know where what things we're going to look for and what things right. we aren't. And we know that these wines that we're going for are going to be those um, have good fruit, good spice, um, you know, just overall a balanced wine. Right. And you really get that in this this class. You know, you brought the white pepper, and I really key in on that. Yeah, it's it's fun because it does change throughout the time it's in glass, mm -hmm. like most wines, but even more so with this because it just has those nuances that you kind of just put your nose into, and you kind of just see how it changes, and you just want to figure out what that next element to the wine will be. 
Yeah. You're totally right because when I first put my nose in there, it was a lot of fruit, a little bit of minerality, and now it's, you know, just now it was a lot of white pepper. Um, even on the palate, you know, white pepper is really coming through now. This fruit's still there. So, I mean, I'll be interested to, when we move on, to come back to it and probably even come back to the Chardonnay just for, you know, a quick, you know, quick mm -hmm. little uh, taste there. But um, this is another really good Pinot Noir. Um, you know, Pinot Noirs are, they're, they're not my absolute top favorite, but I appreciate them. Okay, mm -hmm. so if I'm telling you I like this Pinot Noir, it means it's pretty good, okay? <laughs> I, mean, yeah. um, I had a bad experience way, way, way before I got into wine with Pinot Noir. So yeah. I, just, I wrote them off real early in my wine, wine yeah. life. And then, that's because I was drinking bad Pinot Noir. Yeah. And now I, now being in the industry for as long as I have, now I'm actually starting to drink quality Pinot Noir. So now I'm understanding what Pinot Noir is supposed to be and how it tastes. So now I'm becoming uh, more appreciative of it, so when I find good Pinot Noir, I'm like, oh, this is good, I like this. Yeah. And this is one of those, so. Yeah. Just, just to let you know, if I'm saying it's good, it means it, 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 it uh, one of over a couple hurdles for me internally that I'm like, okay, I like this, this is something I could buy. That's scary. Okay. Yeah, and once again, it's easy on the wallet, you know. It's Even better, easy, right. You know, it's not gonna break the bank like, you know, some other Pinots might do for you these days. So. Yeah. Um, it's nice. Once again, just being able to enjoy it on a on a casual Wednesday night or on a special occasion, this wine's always ready to drink and it's always drinking well, which is which is fun. Um, and you always know what to expect, as I said, under the screw cap, you kind of right. have a, a secure closure, and you just know every time you're going to be popping one, it's going to have that fresh fruit, and those spices are going to just kind of start to develop as the glass right. kind of sits in there. The other night we were at one of the restaurants and I bought a Pinot because I thought it was gonna be the best common, you know, best best wine to pair with what the two entrees were. And I kind of wish I had this one mm -hmm. instead. Not that the other one was bad, it wasn't, but I think this was more to my liking yeah. than, than the other one. Um, yeah. yeah, really nice. It's really, once again, very approachable and just um, delicious. It's just salivating on the palate. Right, yeah. Which is, what I like the most, you know, I really, um, the richness um, throughout all of our wines is something that I think um, stylistically I really, really enjoy. It's kind of that um, unami f flavor mm -hmm. that just kind of salivates on your tongue. And I kind of um, I spent the hardest working in Piemonte after I graduated making Barolos and Barberas. Oh, and man. there's just something about those wines that just always made me like, sit and just like take a breath and I feel the same when I make these wines and when I taste these wines. It's, they're really like kind of um you know just they hit the spot where I wanna good what I like to make and so it's nice you know making these wines and really kind of being truly devoted to making a style that I enjoy personally and that many other people do as well. Very nice. Alright well, let's uh let's go to the cab. Okay. So we got a 2012 cab here from Napa. Yeah, so kind of talk to me about this one. Napa Cab. Um, we do get different sources again throughout the valley, but as we touched upon, um, there is a difference between you know the Calistoga, San Elena, which is northern. It's a little bit warmer, and then as you work your way down the valley towards, excuse me, the bay, um, you do get a little bit cooler aspect. So we do have different sources throughout. And so from up the, up the valley, you get a little bit more of that um, jammy or fruit. And then I feel like down in the valley, you get a little bit more of the tar tobacco flavor. So with this, you get kind of that um, big black and um, briary fruit. And then you get kind of that tar and tobacco from some of the vineyards that we source from down into the southern part of the valley. Okay. Um, but once again, sourcing from these different vineyards where Paul is really out, looking and getting these top top notch vineyards for cross barn um, allows us to have great fruit so it's only 15 percent new oak and once again it just really allows the tannins the natural tannins from the cabernet to be um the the structure um which is very very impressive when you're like oh my god that only has a very minimal amount of new oak right. and yet the tannin structure is very um, it's 
big, but it's very gentle at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's very supple tannins that we, we strive to have with our uh, Cabernet under the cross point. I, yeah, I can tell you that. You know, it really feels like you have that that cross section of Napa um, with the combination of, of the fruit and the minerality um, that being able to source like that is going to give you that, that um, what's, advantage is one of the words, but uh, flexibility is, is what I was looking for. Um, it gives that flexibility to, to really, I guess, probably play with um, how you want to put, blend all those together too, right? Yeah. No, it definitely allows us to see which aspects we like, and when we put the blends together, it, it really allows us to dial it in and really get a great um, great product to put into the bottle. Um, and as I really enjoy from you know making Napa cabs, um, they're a lot they're a lot of work. Oh, people obviously say you know Pinot Noirs they're a lot of work in the vineyards and so on. Pinots are, once they're fermented, you know, they're very minimal winemaking needed during the aging process. We're Cabernets, we're racking them every three to four months. Um, so we're taking it out of the barrels and putting it in the tank to clean it up, to freshen it up, to really help that um, subtle tannin structure that we're, we're, we have with our wines. Um, and so, just because the later harvest with the Cabernet and the more work that we do, the longer aging process of 18 months in oak for the bottle aging or for the um, aging of it mm -hmm. before we put it in the bottle um, really makes it um, a little bit more challenging. But once again, when you have a great product to have at the end of the day and you have a Cabernet in your lineup, it's, right. a, it's a nice, uh, nice addition. Right, exactly. Uh, this one, I definitely... Definitely need to have some food with this. I mean, uh, the tannins are great, um, but it would definitely work better with with some food there. You know, a good steak or whatever. You know, a good pot roast. You know, something savory would be would be outstanding. Especially yeah. get that fruit. You know, I, I can even see this as uh, a Thanksgiving wine because you've got that fruit quality to it. Yeah. Um, as long as the turkey was nice and juicy. Yeah. You know? yeah I think so. <laughs> I usually have a bottle of Cross Barn during Thanksgiving. There you go, right? Even the Pinot Noir. Yeah, yeah, no, but one of I probably have all three at, during Thanksgiving, right. but um, and the holidays are just all three of them. No matter what, uh, aunt, uncle, or grandparent or cousin might right. want, you kind of have everything here that they're gonna enjoy. And that's exactly. Kind of the, it's kind of a nice thing about all of them. If you don't like one particularly, you're gonna probably have another one right. that you really, really enjoy. So. Uh, well, it's made a little more timely since this is a January episode. <laughs> yeah. um, you could, um, I could see this as a Valentine's Day one. Yeah, How this, about that? This is uh, <laughs> our 2012 too, so it's bottled uh, June of 2014, so it's been in bottle for um, five months now, right? Roughly. Okay. And we'll be we'll be aging nicely over a nice next you know 10 years and I've opened up some of our 2008 wines and they're still showing very nicely so the ageability on them is really nice but um, the approachability right now is is very very um, good to see as well it's really nice I mean I like the structure of it I think it's balanced um, got some great tan in there and um, a great great food wine really from what I can tell mm -hmm. and um, you know it's, it's nice and again price point wise these, these are wines, um, and I'll, I'll try to get like, you know, uh, winesearcher.com retail pricing on this. Because I, I know not to ask you guys because it's different all over the world, all over the country yeah. uh, for, for retail. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, these these are all going to be good values. I mean, I kind of know what the wholesale price of these are in general. So I know what my wholesale price is, so I know what the retail should be. So they're, they're good values. So, yeah, yeah they're... They're good bang for the buck um, if you get any three of these. Yeah. But um, yeah, a lot of wine for the price. Is that like exactly, you know. And you know, like, like I said, it's it's not a um, it's not a second label. It's a sister mm -hmm. label. Um, but you know, I think you know you've got something here that's you've got you've got the um, reputation of quality with with Paul Hobbs, yeah. and you're able to replicate that with um, a, a, a wine that's at a a lower price point, lower price point, 
You know, I've had Paul Hobbs wines, and they're, they're excellent wines, too. You, for the price, they're excellent. Too. I'm telling you, they are. You see them anywhere. But, you know, these, these are awesome wines, too. Yeah, that's kind of what, you know, we pride ourselves on throughout the whole, the whole company is just quality. You know, um, the sourcing of the vineyards, the attention to detail, the quality that really um, allows us to put all of our hardest efforts into these, these bottles of wine to share with everybody. Um, and it starts with Paul himself. You know, he's out there... Um, kind of leader working hard and getting us the best fruit and and showing us the ways of making the best wine and it's it's nice to have that leadership. Um, Megan who is the director of winemaking, she also is shares those same values and, and myself and it works around the whole team, the production team, the vineyard team, um, the sales and marketing team all have that same um, same values, um, which is nice, you know, so we really get to, you know, um, enjoy the products that we work so hard for. How's that peanut changing? Yeah, I'm just going back through the wines now. Um, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a white pepper explosion anymore. So yeah. we're getting back to a little more. Actually, it's, it's, it's still minerality. So there's a little bit of fruit. The white pepper isn't as prominent. Um, it's a little more brambly. Okay. Yeah. So um, I like that word because when you say it has woodsiness to it, you start, you, people think that it's, it's the oak, it's an oak barrel thing, um, and it's not, it's, there's a quality to it. So, I mean, it has been, it has been changing in the 36 minutes we've been talking, okay, plus the five minutes prior to we poured it. So, I mean, it's been, it's been changing over that period of time, and it's, it's really nice to see that. Yeah, it's nice, because, you know, obviously, growing up here in Sebastopol, my dad had a little orchard, and we had probably all the different fruits, you know, the apples, the pears, the apricots, the berries, from blue, black, red, everything on our property. So as a kid, I remember tasting all those different fruits, and he also had an herb garden. And so, you know, all the different herbs that we had, you know, from sage, lavender, uh, regno, thyme, right. you know, all of them, uh, you know, it's really interesting seeing them now, and the flavors that you get in obviously different wines, and like, remembering those smells and those flavors as a kid and kind of contributing those right. like the different wines that we make nowadays. So that must, really actually, that that alone from your childhood really, I'm going to, I'm going to guess, kind of gave you a little bit of a, a one-up on other people that were in, in the business because they may not have grown up with that. Yeah, you know, it was a nice, nice, uh, you know, I guess start into my wine, yeah. wine life. Uh, and it just really allowed me to kind of really enjoy, um, I think, mean, working with my hands, smelling the beauty of a really ripe piece of fruit, you know? Right. I'm, we're fortunate, you know, we have a lot of great fruit and, you know, um, produce out in this area, and so right. we really get to enjoy the freshest, um, freshest of what uh, Mother Earth gives us, and this is kind of one of those things as well with the grapes that we have. Very nice. Well, one, I know you have something to do, two, because we had the lights on super bright to try to come back the backlight, that light's gone out. This was probably gonna go out soon. So we're gonna go and wrap things up. Um, I really appreciate you uh, spending some time with me, uh, going over these great wines. Absolutely. Um, folks, if you see Cross Barn out there in the store or at a restaurant, or just you know go to the Cross Barn site, um, and uh, you can get it there, I'm sure. I mean, I'm sure there's a few Yeah, we always have them available on the website. Um, crossbarn.com and right. that's the beauty of also Cross Barn is that they're always readily available for you um, whether you have it in your local market or um, purchase it online. Right, and, and is, the, uh, is the winery also open to the public? Um, unfortunately no, but they okay. could always come uh, to the Paul Hobbs winery and okay. take a tour there and try the Cross Barn wine Got it. during okay. that time. And just so you know about Paul Hobbs, uh, call, make an appointment, it's not just to you know, just show up and say hi. Um, and uh, and I, that's my suggestion. That this is the end of, of, of my week here, and um, I've been lucky enough. Not besides the fact that I had appointments for all these um, other wineries I visited outside of interview stuff. Pretty much, um, some of them you really need to make sure you have an appointment. Um, others you can just walk up, and it's an open tasting room and all that. But um, definitely, you know, I would say before you come out, plan ahead. Um, Check out their websites of, of any winery and yeah. to see if they have a tasting room hours. If not, if not, make the appointment. Um, for the most part, they're you know unless there's some 
super premium exclusive cult wine, they're probably going to say, yeah, come on in. So um, at least that was my experience um, with that. So, But anyway, uh, we're going to wrap things up. Uh, as always, everybody, I want to thank you for stopping by. Um, I'm going to uh, have a link below to uh, the Crossbarn Winery. And we'll also put Paul Hobbs down there. That way you can kind of uh, get, uh, get all the information there. Um, click the links above uh, to friend me up. Again, I'm not pointing over to Greg. I'm just pointing where the PayPal button is over here. So if you want to send a few uh, ducats my way, uh, please do. And uh, we'll see everyone again.